the problem. You mean to tell me we're finished for the hour? No, no, that's what I was building up to. What do you do then? You got two minutes. You just want to see somebody else, or you need to pick up your grandchild, or the terms, the battle for structure happens. We have to help people learn how this stuff works. They don't walk into your little room and know how it works. Even in my room, you would think, oh, they know how it works. No. No, we may not know. We have an imagination. We don't know how it works. I'm just hurting. That's what I know, for sure. And you're a servant, so you should do whatever I tell you to do. No, that's not the way it works. So we're going to talk about how a service works in this field, right? See, all that's, all that's happening in a matter of minutes. So I would ask you to take that little notebook you have and start to build, start, you don't have to finish it, start to build the structure you need to meet with people. Mm -hmm. Then get a little group in your church and gather and talk about it. Oh, I'd probably add this or, or yeah, you probably don't need to do that. And you just work up a little, little strategy for care ministry. I've had people take my classes and the pastor after it's 48 hours in the structure now, in the old days it was different, but whatever it is called, pastoral counselor or pastoral care provider, whatever you call it, the pastor would get up after they were finished and get their little certificate and he would say, I want everybody to like, you can put your eyes up here for a minute. Now, Jane has just completed the pastoral care specialist program. Now, she's, while she's not, a, not taking Aetna for insurance or anything, this is care when you're struggling and you need access to somebody who will listen and has a way to refer to people in the community if needed. But she, she does that now. And if you want her information, it's in the bulletin. And you can clarify it so somebody thinks it doesn't get it confused. You have a little description in the bulletin. And it's a wonderful ministry. And now you have a title maybe, but it's really an identity of a provider of care. You are a provider of care. Does that make sense? There's a ton more things. People ask me, well, what about pay? Well, you know, in the caring ministry, we don't always, that's a touchy subject. In the church, it's a subject, a uh, difficult subject, spiritual life. And there's lots of challenges there. But I want to mention two things that sound the opposite, but both are true, in my opinion. One is, it turns out the culture we're living in does people do not take things seriously unless they're paying for it in some way, unless there's a value in it. So if I come and see you, and okay, I'm not paying you, we can, we could, most of us probably wouldn't collect a fee, but you could give to the church. You could say, part of what I do is I give to the church. That helps this ministry happen. You could bring in a pie for the dinner coming up this week. You could do 100 things, but if I don't, you know what we've learned in the real clinics and hospitals? We've learned if somebody's on complete entitlement, it's not completely true, but the risk goes up, they won't come back, even though it doesn't cost them anything. They won't come back, because there's no investment there. Whoa. Or you ask them, okay, now next week, I'd like you to write a list down of the things you most argue over with your wife. Could you write, write a list? Oh, yeah, I can do that. And then they come back, oh, man, I forgot to do that. <laughs> I can, well, I could probably sit here and think of it. Let me do it. They're not taking it seriously, right? I've had people come into my office, and they basically do this. They say, well, why I'm here is I don't want to live. I've actually not wanted to live for about five years. I look at my life where I should be at 50, and it's nowhere near what it's looking like. I don't want to live this life anymore. And I've felt this way for five years. I don't want to be married to this person. I don't want to live in Connecticut, whatever it is. Can, can, we, can I see you for a little bit, maybe three sessions, and we take care of this? Wait a minute. Three sessions, five years, probably more like 10 years. It's not the way it works, but that's what people think because we're in a fix it, quick fix it culture. Another thing about this soul work, it is not quick fix. The soul does not care if you can do this in three seconds. It doesn't trust it. Our souls know better. Look in our Bibles. Psychologically, look in the Bible and see how many fix-it stories there are. There are some, not many. It turns out the way God seems to mostly work is shaping us, learning from problems. And then the same problem comes up. And I made the same mistake. And then I had to learn it a different way. It turns out the Bible's a pretty, a pretty revealing 
uh, document about how God really heals. And somebody, I, I am embarrassed to say, but I will admit that when I was in psychiatric training down at um, Connecticut Valley Hospital for a year, first book I want to say that I read, I didn't actually read it, first book I was assigned was a book that had only one thing I remember to this day, and it was the first page, and it was a quote from the author. Harry Stack Sullivan was the author. In his day, he was something. And probably if I'd read that book, I would have learned a lot more. But I did learn from that first page, which was simply his quote saying, what heals is relationship. Wow. I think I even tore that page out and said, if I read nothing else, not realizing I would actually read nothing else, but if I read nothing else, I'm going to keep that. Because I'm pretty sure that's a very truthful kind of statement. We could talk spiritually about what heals is relationship. Medicine can help. Exercise can help heal. Medicine can heal, help heal. But it turns out, if you don't trust the person giving you the medicine, <laughs> if you don't believe, if you don't have, and the same thing spiritualized. If it weren't for the relationship with Jesus Christ, I think my, my theology tells me the healing's going to be pretty hard. <laughs> it took that relationship. And that's the first thing I thought of when I ripped that page out. It was my book, so I didn't get in trouble for that. But... I think that's something we need to remember. And so what you're doing to create a relationship, not buddy-buddy go to dinner relationship, but caring, I'm interested in you. You know how many of us see someone this week where they really don't have a life where people are interested in them? Boy, could I tell you stories. I can tell you so many stories. I had one lady I worked with for a year and a half. She's 75, and all her grown children have nothing to do with her. Now, she may have contributed to some of this, but I've learned painfully what this lady is suffering from when nobody's actually interested. I'm the one that she, she, she identifies as most interested in her. So part of my work is to help her be interested in almost anybody else in the place she lives, over dinner with one person, and try to expand her access to care for relationships. But... This is very common. After three years of the pandemic, it was one of the, one of the things. We had everybody isolate, and then if you were already on fragile terms with the people who might care, you're probably at the far end now. And we tripled the amount of people coming into my clinic. I retired and then went to this clinic with the idea I wouldn't have to see a whole lot of people. That has not been the case. Because at the very same time, three years ago, I came, the pandemic came, and we tripled the amount of people coming in. We, folks, we tripled the amount of men. We weren't seeing that many men. But we had a lot of men saying, I don't, like, I don't like things in my life right now. Relationships. And then we had another group that were working from home. And marriages fell apart. I, didn't have, I, I thought marriage was great when I didn't have to see him all the time. <laughs> I'm looking for something I can, that he can do for five hours now. And all of a sudden you realize what's happening in the soul, the soul of the marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is great work. You need a structure. There's a lot more to be said about it. Let me let you ask some questions here about anything, anything at all. Folks, we're only scratching the surface. I understand that. Every class I teach, even though it's 48 hours, these class, these seven-week classes, three trimesters, three semesters, um, but we always have people say, boy, we, we didn't really cover that much. So I, if you're feeling that, that's okay. There's a lot here. The soul is bottomless. And what Tom Moore says, and I agree with it, what we're really missing in our day, and we need education about the soul. We just need education about the soul. Take a class on soul. Where would you find one? Where are you going to find one? That's what this is about. It's 3,000 years old of wisdom in a, in a culture that has identified too much. The latest book is always the best on anything. It's not true. Not true. There's some great books out there, but Facebook isn't always the best. So, um, all right. Questions, comments, disagreement. I welcome it. I'll pass it with Frank the Raptors.
Um, so how do you um, help uh, with people who ask you, um, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> Yeah, it, of course, you know, some bit of living off that question, um, and it's a good question. Um, the why question is academic. So I want to acknowledge that. I hear those questions as academic. Behind the question, they're probably not suffering with academics. So I might not punt it, but I would be assessing. By the way, what we do here when you sit with somebody in care is on the one hand show empathy and care and listening, but you're also just making sure that um, they've got a, a vo someone they can be with. So that's care. Care in, in the oldest term was actually putting your hands out and holding them and so forth. So in an assessment, the assessment we do is trying to wonder what bothers them the most. It could be an academic question, but if they're coming to you for help, there's something behind the question. So I might say, this is a Mark McKinney style, you'll have your own, that'll probably be better than mine, but I will say, that is a great question, and you may know there's a book written about that, that um, Lawrence, uh, Jewish author, tremendous book. But anyway, there's a lot of books out there about it. Let, well, let's, let's talk about that in a minute. But can you, it would help me to understand what bothers you most about that question? Mm -hmm. Is it that you felt you've had more, I mean, what, what, what stirred that question up for you? And if they say, well, I took a class and I just want to talk about it, that's fine. You can just academically talk about it. Most people, they feel it's personal. They've got a son who's had more than his share, and I want to make sure I assess what's under the question. That can be a dodging question. What we've learned over time in my work is that the culture has values that make it hard to get to soul. So one of them is spirit in the old Greek idea include thinking, and we like to think. We'll have men that easily say, so what's it like going through a divorce? Well, I think, I think, I think, they can't talk about feelings. And academic questions can be that way. I honor that, but I will say, can, can I ask you first, and then we'll get into that, what bothers you most about the question? Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I want to know an illustration. Most of all, what I want to do is what the Bible tends to do a lot of. I'd like to hear a story or two. I'd like to hear a story. You know, let's talk about your son just for a minute. And then we can come back next week and we'll both have some notes about why do so many bad things happen to good people? Why not being good? Why? See, there's a, all kinds of assumptions and imagination around that question. The assumption that if I'm good, there should be some formula out there that has me not have bad things happen. And the book of Job is all about that. I mean, that's what the book of Job is. It's a story about the assumption that if you're good, bad things shouldn't happen. So all his friends say, wait a minute, it's not, it's not the way it is. There's a formula out there. It seems to be in the air for human life that we think God should have a formula for this. But if God really had a formula around that, and this is only academic, you and me, we have no way to hear God explain this other than scripture, in my view. But we're, we're gonna be in a pickle if we just academically try to do it all academically. Because they're hurting. And Joe was hurting. He didn't need, he didn't need people going by and judging him for having too many bad things happen. And that's what in the end happened. So there's no formula that I can hear, which is why grace, becomes the pivotal New Testament idea. I have a woman that comes into my office and she's not very connected to church at all. Her entire theology, which is extremely well informed, comes from the internet. Can you imagine that? Her entire theology. And she is fixated right now on the end times. She's fixated on that. Learning as much as she can about who, who, whoever wants to put something on the internet, she'll find out about it. And she's tormented. And one day I asked her, when you do all this exploring, have you come across the word grace? And what does that mean? No, she, she had a piece of paper. She said, let's talk about that. What, what is that? And a thorn in the flesh comes to mind as well because 
we make assumptions that the prayer of Paul was not answered because his thorn was not removed. But actually, that's not theologically really correct. I mean, the prayer was answered. What was the answer God gave Paul? That's right. Grace was the answer. But that doesn't fit our modern culture's answer. The answer should look like fixed problem. No more bad things happening, please. So, But I'd be very careful not to do any of that until I'd heard her pain. If she has some. Now, some people just like academics and they like to sit and talk for an hour. And I'm known to do that on occasion. But I'm really in the business of caring. So it may be that the logical approach to somebody is actually their prison. So they can't get to the real parts of their hurt because they do this, this intellectual discussion all the time. But they're tormented by the, the brain. Service or being a servant is the role. Caring is what I'm doing through service, through through this role I have. And leadership would be demonstrating that at a time when. And here's the other thing: you'll hear me say culture a lot because we make assumptions based on what the culture has absorbed. We've absorbed. So leadership's a popular thing. I mean, I went 10 years at St. Francis with every year a book be, being written, usually from the Harvard Business School, about healthcare leadership. Now, there weren't bad things, but they were very um, narrow of their scope. So, leadership, I would just go back to the scripture, leadership looks countercultural. You may not be standing up in front. The, biggest, the most leadership going on in a church may be quietly happening in the Sunday school classroom, and we don't, we're not badging them. We're not giving them an office, a big certificate. It's, it's humble. It's quiet. It's in the dark places, not the glamorous Facebook or LinkedIn. I just got whatever. So it's, it's, your, it's my role to purposely get in perspective when I talk, which is what I did today. I don't care what degree I have. The measure of the service and caring you feel when I'm with you should be the thing you think of first when you say, go see Mark. Mm -hmm. If indeed somebody says, and this does happen, they'll say, well, you know, Mark McKinney has a doctorate, and he has this, and he's been doing it for 45 years, and he should be dead by now, and he's really still alive <laughs> and doing it. You know, I haven't done my job the way ideally I'd like. I'd like people to know that, but can you imagine how different that sounds? He's got all the credentials, so you don't have to worry about it, and you can get that note paper. How does that sound different than the woman? This is a real story. Not too long ago, after years at St. Francis, I was giving a talk just like this at another part of the state. And after the talk, a lady with her son who stood above her came up and she looked at me and she said, you won't remember me, but I just need to hug you. I thought it was a great talk, whatever she said. You know, they all say it's a great talk. Anyway, so she, we, she hugged me and she said, this is Joe. You won't remember Joe because Joe wasn't born when I met you. But I was struggling with the decision around an abortion. And I remember sitting with you. And I remember we prayed together. And I, after that, I decided on my own, I'm going with the challenge. Joe just graduated college. And he wanted me to make sure I come up here and introduce him. There was nothing in there about a degree I had. There was nothing in there about some book I recommended. Or that's what we're remembered for if it's coming from a leadership model mm -hmm. that by definition seems paradoxical. Service. Mm -hmm. We have an image of leadership. But 
the similarity would, would be for me, you're the leadership expert. I'm, I'm just speaking as a counselor, really. What would be similar is the outcome should be great. And it can be if all people say is, you know, and there's psychological uh, defense of this. If I come in and I say, John, I've done this orthopedic surgery a million times. I've never had a single problem. So we're gonna do this today at two o'clock. I'm gonna roll you out at five and you'll live your life just like you used to. We have psychological evidence. John will have confidence and probably heal better. Mm -hmm. Placebo effect. It's the confidence I'm giving them that all those credentials mean good stuff and it can have an effect. I don't think that's in the same ballpark as a woman saying, I don't even know how to explain it, but my son's here and I would just I had to come and hear you talk so you could see my son. It's not the same ballpark to me. It's all good, but it's in a different ballpark. And it speaks to who you are. And you will feel better about who you are than all the accolades someone puts on. So the leadership is just coming from a different lens. And we often, and I know you do this, Reggie, but we almost have to redefine it. Can I mention one other thing? Uh, and then whatever questions, let's get to any more questions. If it were to me, and I, I'm really conscious, is this, is this going on the internet, by the way? Anybody know where this is going? You're going to have it on the internet. Okay, stop it. Thank you. All the things I've said. <laughs> All right. Um, I want I want to be conscious of uh, when you when you do your work. You need to feel good about your work, even though it's not perfect. Um, but one of the things I struggle with to this day is that while we diagnose people individually. As, a, as an industry, most of the care given in psychiatry is one-on-one. -on -one. You come to see me, I sit down, I make an assessment. It's one-on-one. -on -one. But the reality is, and we give you a diagnosis. The reality is, if we could, I would diagnose the culture I'm in. Can you imagine that? The town of Danbury is obsessive compulsive. I think I can make a case for that. <laughs> and if we could give Danbury some medicine, so, so the whole town slows down, not every person, but the town, mm -hmm. if there were such a thing, an animal called Danbury. The town, the country, we have pathology all around us, and then we think we see you individually and help you, and you're facing this mm -hmm. anxious 84 mm -hmm. highway. Who do we think we are? Mm -hmm. The culture has problems. And we need to be aware of that when somebody comes individually to us, they think it's them. They'll say, my identity is, well, I am bipolar. No, no. You may ha have aspects that someone's helped you with to understand that's going on in your psyche and in your behavior and stuff like that. But if there was anybody that was bipolar, it's probably the country or the you know, we're all split, we're all arguing with each other, we're moody, we, go, we drive too fast, we, we watch CNN and there's 10 things on it at the same time. How could I not be a little buzzed in my head and confused? Who, who escapes that? Can we have you see me once a week and suddenly it doesn't matter, all that stuff's going on? James Hillman, I think, for making us aware of that. It will help you not demonize yourself or someone else that's seeing you. I will say that all the time. You know, we're going to help you. But you may have to shut some things out. Because there's more out there in this world when you leave this office than there is in you. Very likely, there's a lot more out there. And so we have to learn to block some of that out. And I help people with that. Because we can't, we can't admit Dan Barry to the hospital. <laughs> We can't give it medicine. We can't diagnose it. But we could be aware. It's okay because all of us, whether we admit it or not, are a little bit more anxious in the day we live and the time. How could you not feel some of that after three years of political tension and pandemic? So I'm really empathetic. But I want people to be aware of that because if we don't, and people do think, I am so sick, increase my medicine. 
I'm still, and people say that to me. They'll say, I, I, I was still really anxious yesterday when a car in front of me stopped suddenly and then I stopped. Who wouldn't be anxious? You know? So that's okay. We're going to work, work on that. Okay. Quite, any final? Yes, please. Uh, my question is, um, does it um, diminish your leadership role when you share, you know, like you identify and you share what your, your personal story is with someone? Mm. Or should you even do that? You should. And, but the supervision becomes the key. And actually, there was a point here that I got you for everything. Question? Yeah. I said, um, does it diminish your leadership if you share your personal or you identify with the person you're counseling? It, it increases your leadership, mm -hmm. to be honest. Amen. You don't need to say, oh, so let me tell you how that went. When I was five, my father, and if you've got a few minutes, let me, you know, you don't need to go through everything. Mm -hmm. But I think they need, I think people need to know we're human, mm -hmm. we're imperfect. Yes that we don't know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But that's where you get a good assessment. I get a good assessment when I say to somebody, I don't have an answer to that, and see how they look. What? How long you been doing this work? <laughs> What's that degree on your wall? <laughs> you don't really know how? To... Oh, there's a lot of things I don't know. And there are things I used to know that I realize now I don't know. But that'll make it worse. That's the way this stuff works. The human person is complex. And I'm helping them see the reality that no one else may say. The world is complex, and we're more aware of that complexity because of the internet. Mm -hmm. There was a guy. Um, there was a guy in New York City that made his. Uh, that at one point said this. This he said this 20 years ago. He said the movement in the world religiously will become more fundamental in all religions over the next 20 years. 30 years. And uh, Bill Moyer, somebody I did get to know years ago, went to the same school I went to. But he, he asked him, well, why would that be? And he said, well, I'm already seeing it, but here's why. In a world where you, it, in a world where everything's complex, but now you know it's complex. You know there's two sets of facts that both can't be true, but, but you're not sure which one is. When you become more aware, and the internet has thrown that at us, you would love to have somebody, most would love to have somebody come on the screen and say, it seems complex, just follow what I'm saying. I'm gonna tell you exactly, it's not that complex, just follow what I say. Believe this one thing. And then you start to, whew, I'm glad somebody out there is gonna simplify everything. But the reality is, it is complex. And we need somebody appreciating that I can be with you to help you in the complexity. You don't have to worry about all the complexity. You don't have to know all the complexity. But it will not end. If you decide you're going to watch CNN and you're going to take the internet in and all that stuff, it's not going to stop tomorrow. But you could reduce it and take what you do believe, and I would support you in that. But I, I think leadership is being honest. Mm -hmm. I am a complex person. You may not see that in me today, but I'm complex. There are things that don't make sense that I said last week, but today it's different. We're all like that. That's okay. In the early years, in the um, 1500s, in the Enlightenment and, and, and Christianity, there was an appreciation for mystery. There's some things we don't know. We're living in an age that likes to know everything. Mm -hmm. I kind of would like to live in my home where there's still some mystery. Because when there's mystery, I get to ask more questions and know more. Mm -hmm. We like all the answers. So I good leadership is staying away from giving all the answers. Mm -hmm. Biblical answers, all kinds of answers. I'm just a big one for saying, in the psychological work of my ministry, I like questions. Mystery's OK. We'll get an answer sometime. But I don't, I'm not just, well, do this, do this. There's an answer here, there's an answer there. There are biblical answers, and I'm not suggesting there aren't. But that's how I would, a good leadership is honest. Amen. And I might even share an illustration or two, but I would have gone to supervision and worked out that story before I just share it with somebody. Because mm -hmm. the biggest problem in therapy is that I suddenly share it, and I never thought through it. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. I'm the client, mm -hmm. and they're trying to help me. Mm -hmm. So you get it.
Has this been helpful? Yeah. 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 Uh, let me give you my email address for anybody that wants it.